panel. And the slides will be made available on the ISS page. So I am very thrilled to have today um, with us uh, Maggie Levenstein, who is the director of ICPSR. Um, if you go to the report link that I just put, there is a long bio. She serves on every committee known to man and advises everyone. Uh, but Maggie, most importantly for me, is the director of ICPSR. And then Dan Gilman is a statistician at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and has a number of overlap committees. But in addition to that, also serves on every other committee known to man. So both of them are really experts. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start out with uh, Ms. Levenstein. <laughs> Uh, so, oh, so, okay. Um, so I can't see the slides yet, but maybe that you haven't shown it. So hi, everybody. I'm Maggie Levenstein. Um, uh, first of all, thank you um, to Bob Ray and to um, the ISIS um, Professional Development um, Committee um, for organizing this and for inviting me to participate. Um, it's it's actually nice to see kind of the size of the group. It's 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 large enough that I think we and we've got a critical mass of people. Please do feel um, you know like you can raise your hand and interrupt. So I'm I'm not sure I can see if you raise your hand, um, but I I am happy to have somebody tell me if there's a question or, or um, things because I think these are the things we're going to talk about today really are are motivated by this the report, the National Academies report that Dan and I um, both participated in. But um, but these are also important issues that I'm sure all of you are thinking about every day. And, and, and I'm happy to have a discussion about any of them. Um, as uh, I also want to just highlight, I, I am the the director of ICPSR. Um, Bob Ray is actually um, our, um, is, a, is a longtime OR and, um, and a member of the ICPSR Council, and you are now officially our vice chair, um, uh, I believe, is that right? Sure. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, we, um, I, was, I was trying to remember what that exact title was, but the, Bob Ray is the vice chair, so we really appreciate everything that he has done um, for ICPSR over the years. And I would imagine that there are other um, ICPSR ORs out there in the audience, if I haven't met you um, yet, um, um, I look, I'm glad you're here and thank you for what you're doing. And um, I'm happy to talk more about um, all of that as we go forward. Um, so are you sharing the slides now? Cause I can't see, oh, there we go. Okay, the way that I've got um, these up here. Okay, um, so now I can't see me, but I can see the slides. So I am gonna talk about um, a report from the National Academies of Science. Um, this is the link to the report and um, Bob Ray also put it um, in the chat uh, in, and you can just Google it and, and find it. It's pretty easy, it's free if you wanna download it, um, if you haven't done that. There are also a number of related um, National Academies reports that, um, that I would urge you to take a look at. Some of them I'm actually gonna talk about briefly um, today, um, but this is something which the National Academies and in particular the Committee on National Statistics um, has been focusing on for a while. So I, um, I urge you to take a look at those. Next slide. Okay, <laughs> so I wanna acknowledge um, um, all of the um, panel members that were that contributed to the report um, and the, the CNSAT staff, Michael Cohen and Michael Seary, who were um, really um, critical in, um, in, in producing the report. I also wanna give a special shout out to Sarah Nusser because I stole some of her slides in preparing this presentation. And, uh, and she said, oh, that was perfectly fine for something like this, but I, in, in the spirit of always acknowledging what you, you know, borrow, beg, and steal. I want to um, give thanks to Sarah in particular for that. Um, and Dan um, Kasprick from um, NORC um, was the chair of the committee. So thanks. This is the what I'm presenting is really um, is the results of the joint work of everyone on the, cons on the consensus panel. Um, next slide. Um, so the original context for this report 
um, was that it was commissioned um, by the National um, uh, Science Foundation's National Center for uh, Science and Engineering Statistics. So this is the, the statistical agency um, for the United States that studies science and engineering that's inside NSF. Um, and they they um, they commissioned CNSTAT and the National Academies to write a report that would help to enhance the transparency and reproducibility of NCSES's um, statistics and facilitate improvement of the statistical program workflow processes of the agencies and its contractors. Um, with encouragement from NCSES, um, the panel expanded the scope to provide advice for all federal statistical agencies. Um, I think. There actually was a, a, um, a workshop that preceded um, the commissioning of the panel that involved multiple statistical agencies um, and was actually, I think, initiated by my predecessor um, as director of ICPSR um, in collaboration with, um, with other statistical agencies and other faculty um, to talk about reproducibility and transparency for the statistical system. And, and um, NCSES really um, took the ball from there and took the leadership in, um, in creating this panel, but I think with an understanding that um, it was it wanted to use this as an opportunity to provide some guidance and leadership um, to the statistical community um, as a whole. And I and I have to say I want to really call out NCSES has done this in a number of ways um, over the last several years, and I think they deserve a lot of credit for um, for being willing to. Um, to take on issues that some of the bigger agencies, I think, probably have a harder time um, being innovative uh, uh, and having the flexibility to do. So, so thanks, big shout out to NCSES for doing that. Next slide. All right, so the first thing is that, and maybe this is completely obvious, but I think it is extremely important to say it over and over and over again. Um, why do we care about transparency and reproducibility? Um, and I think that there are three critical things that we have to just emphasize over and over again. One of the most obvious, in the, particularly in the current environment, is trust, that there is a lot of skepticism about science, science about social science in particular, about the statistical agencies. I mean, just yesterday, or the day before, when we had the in, Environmental Protection Agency going to um, Palestine, um, Pennsylvania, to talk to people about um, the exposures that they'd had as a result of uh, um, the train um, uh, accident there. And, and people don't trust, they don't trust the government, and they don't trust scientists, and they don't trust agencies. And by, um, and we can't, we can't solve that only with transparency and reproducibility. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to, you know, live in la la land here. But I don't think we can solve the trust problem without transparency. And so I think that both. Um, uh, this is this is critical both for science, very generally for social science, um, and it is also true in particular for our statistical agencies which both depend on the trust of the community to provide them with data and depend on the trust and the confidence in the broader public um, in the numbers that they produce and share with us. Um, so uh, given the, the skepticism um, about, about the government and about data and about science, this is just a really critical issue today. Um, transparency and reproducibility are also um, important for scientific progress. We, we, when we understand what our what people have done, we can build knowledge builds on um, what's already happened. Um, as I said, I built today's um, talk on what um, on what Sarah Nusser did and what everything we did on this panel built on what previous panels did, and because of that, we're able to. Um, to learn and to have incremental progress. Um, there may be people who invent things, you know, and we, we, we need sometimes to, to break um, uh, a path and go a different direction, but much scientific progress um, is inherently incremental. And even if you're doing something completely different, you need to be able to have that deep understanding of what happened before. And we get that through transparency and we get that through being able to reproduce and replicate what others have done. And then finally, efficiency in the use of scientific resources. Um, when we, as I'm sure you all know, um, 
We, we don't have an abundance of, uh, of scientific resources, particularly those that create data. Um, and when we, when, we create, when we use those resources and then don't make them available to others to reuse, we actually, um, we are throwing away important investments um, in the scientific process. And so um, transparency and reproducibility really allow us to reuse resources and um, uh, efficiently and um, or more efficiently um, and enhance progress given the limited resources that we have. Um, next slide. So the policy context for this, I actually, um, uh, is that as, as probably many of you in the audience know, there has been a lot of evidence um, in this new data-driven age um, on leveraging data for policymaking. This was captured in the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act um, that followed the Evidence-Based Policymaking Commission and that led to the evidence, uh, the Committee on Evidence-Based, the, the Advisory Committee, ACDEB on Evidence-Based Policymaking, which just issued its um, uh, final report um, at the end of last year. Um, also at the end of last year, there was another um, National Academies report called the 20, Toward a 21st Century National Data Infrastructure, Mobilizing Information for the Common Good. So this report was um, issued after the report that we're talking about today, but in it focuses on the use of um, digital trace data, particularly from commercial sources for improving um, the federal statistical system. Doing that creates enormous potential and it completely creates all kinds of very big challenges for transparency and reproducibility for the federal statistical system. Um, the data that come from private sources, whether they're things that the Bureau of Economic Analysis has been getting for decades, um, or whether they are things that they're thinking about getting from companies you know, in Silicon Valley today, um, those there's often a lot of or uh, there is an, a lot of lack of transparency that helps that that creates confusion and misunderstanding about how um, our statistics are created, and that confusion and um, lack of transparency can undermine confidence. We want to use all of the data resources at our um, uh, at our disposal to create the best possible estimates, but we need to be as open as we possibly can be about them. Um, so that people understand what it is that we're measuring. I, um, for many years, I taught macroeconomics and I spent a good um, bunch of time to help people to understand how we actually um, measure GDP because people thought it came down from God. And, um, and, and people, and when people, uh, to be informed citizens, let alone uh, good scientists, people need to understand how data is created in order to use it in, um, uh, well. Um, our statistical agencies have traditionally relied on surveys, um, though they have never exclusively relied on surveys, even when they were giving the reports of surveys. Um, and today they are increasingly relying on other kinds of instruments, both because survey um, response uh, rates have gone down um, and gone down in ways that, as many of you probably know, really challenge the quality of our surveys. So the American Community Survey during the pandemic did not get enough respondents to, to come out on time and with the quality that we expected. Um, uh, there are other surveys that have, you know, frighteningly low response rates and we need to, um, uh, so we need to rely on other kinds of data and human beings are creating other kinds of data um, that we uh, can get in other ways besides surveys, but that means that there's no survey instrument um, that explains where the data come from. And that, and that again, the lack of survey instruments means that there's less transparency, there's less documentation um, for those of us who are in the business of creating documentation for, um, for data users. Um, it's, it's just more challenging to explain how data is collected and um, without, without both the survey instruments and the uh, and explanations of how a sample was designed and gathered and all of that. Um, that's more challenging when we, um, uh, uh, when we are using um, other methods. Um, the, another, uh, I think increasingly, as we all know, we're relying on um, algorithms that generate data. Um, and th those are very, they can, they can provide us with a lot of information about the world, um, but the algorithms themselves 
um, change, can can change and change for reasons that are um, difficult to uh, that are not for statistical purposes and are difficult to observe. I actually thought that was a great example of this, and I want to share it just sort of to bring it to your attention because especially if you're working with with students and others, and people are sort of saying like, oh, if I get something from the algorithm, I can just I can just use. Google search, or I can just use, you know, chat GPT, and I completely believe in using those, but people should understand that particularly over time, those algorithms change and they change for very good reasons. But that means that the way that it's just like, if you change your sampling strategy halfway through a sample, you, need, you wanna be able to know that and to document that in order to understand what kind of inference you can make from data. Um, and the this latest example of how um, NORAD is um, monitoring um, um, unidentified flying objects flying over North America, and they monitor radar. And after the Chinese balloon went across North America, they clearly changed their monitoring algorithm to pick up much smaller objects, which led to their identifying and shooting down three more objects, which maybe was a good thing or maybe not. But they, but they weren't even in the time series before because those things were considered blips that we ignore. And um, and now they're now they're there, and we don't know whether those whether that's a new object or whether that's a result of the algorithm. There is an enormous amount of information that we get this way that we only know about um, if we understand. We understand um, if we understand um, the algorithm that generates the data. That's part of transparency. Next um, slide. Um, Obviously, this has been an important issue in federal um, science policy. Um, 2023 is the year of open science, um, uh, the president declared. Um, last year, um, the office, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy um, issued a memorandum on, on ensuring, oh, that should say free, immediate and equitable access <laughs> to federally funded research, not free. Um, uh, this is also known as the Nelson uh, Memo. And again, this is about creating transparency and reproducibility on the new NIH data management policy, um, which went into effect last month is again about, um, uh, about encouraging um, better um, uh, management of data, access to data for reproducibility and transparency purposes. There's a link there to both the NIH data management policy and to ICPSR's resource page to help researchers um, uh, follow that policy and to help anybody who's supporting researchers who are trying to follow that policy. So we want that open book for science. Um, and this is something which is uh, which every agency um, in the federal government now following the OSTP memo is really um, is, is trying to implement in their own way. So that includes all the science agencies and all the statistical agencies. Um, next slide. Um, academic norms are also changing. So we, we think about this in terms of, and this report is really about um, how about how this applies to um, federal statistical agencies, but obviously um, this is something which the academic and the research community more generally um, is addressing. Um, publications we might think of no longer as simply the research, but as, as, as an advertisement for research. And increasingly um, uh, journals are requiring um, that re results be reproduced by a third party prior to publication. Um, they're requiring um, that researchers or authors share their data, share their metadata and share their code so that others can reproduce the results in that research. And again, reproducing this, it's, um, I think people often think about this, again, it is helpful for building trust for people who aren't skeptical, oh, you didn't just make this up, but it is also to help people understand and critique and build on this research. Um, I know in economics, we, we routinely assign um, uh, graduate students to go and reproduce um, the results in an article because by actually looking at the code, getting the data, running it again, they understand what the research is actually showing and what it's not showing and how they how the research was actually conducted in a way you couldn't possibly do in any other way. We want um, as journals and funders and um, and 
and scientific societies are requiring that research be reproducible and that more transparent um, and, and data and metadata and code be shared to facilitate that. We want those resources to be fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Fair data supports high quality research. If the federal statistical agencies, which provide so much of the data that's used in scientific research are fair, um, that will also improve the quality of research. I put in here a little plug for something called JEDI, which is um, supported by Data Pass, which is an organization that ICPSR um, is part of and actually helped to found long before I was um, its director. And Data um, JEDI is a, an organization of journal editors um, that really provides um, uh, a, a, a conversation space for journal editors um, to think about um, how to improve um, best practices with regard to fair data and, um, and open, reproducible, and transparent um, scientific research, um, and, and lots of other things um, that journal editors, challenges that journal editors face. Um, but we've been really happy to support that. If any of you um, know about journal editors who would be would benefit from this, particularly if you're trying to think about how to um, improve their practices regarding transparency and reproducibility for their journal, I urge you to um, direct them to JEDI or to direct yourself to JEDI if you're an editor. Next slide. So why transparency and reproducibility for federal statistics? I talked about it in terms of, um, in terms of researchers and pub and uh, and, and journals and, um, and those who fund research. Why is this important for federal statistics? Um, well, it, um, we talked about this in part, right? It, it enables understanding quality and resistance in the operations of the federal statistics agency. So in addition to all of the things that I talked about, about trust in federal statistics, it actually is critically important because we are, we are undergoing constantly, but we are actually on the on the precipice of some very big um, um, turnover in um, in the labor force in the federal statistical agencies. And the, the, uh, the, the people who work in our federal statistical agencies are incredibly committed and knowledgeable. And if all of that knowledge is in their head and not written down and not reproducible and transparent, then there is enormous um, risk to, um, to the quality of our federal statistics um, as those transitions take place. And it becomes, um, and, and maintaining high quality statistics becomes much more expensive. So for very practical reasons, having our federal statistical agencies embrace transparency and reproducibility, documenting their own processes in ways that are transparent to third parties, even within their own organizations. That might seem obvious. It is it's actually an enormous amount of work to make things, to write code and to make a process for producing statistics um, uh, transparent to somebody else who you, who you do not speak to. Um, we know that um, in the way that we share data here at ICPSR, it is even harder when you're talking about things um, like the kinds of things that the Bureau of Economic Analysis does. Um, and it's even hard when you're talking about just presenting the results of a survey when when you, when the survey has you know different ways of handling missing data, has different ways of aggregating data, has different ways of handling changes in data measurement over time. All of those things need to be documented, sometimes just for internal purposes, sometimes for external purposes as well, in order to maintain the quality that we expect from the federal statistical agencies. Again, as I said, it promotes trust, trust and credibility with users and the public. Um, as I'm gonna repeat a couple of times, different users have different requirements to realize transparency. So, um, and I, I, um, I, I, first, one of the things that I was struck by in, in the process of writing this report and the open hearings that we had is that for some users, um, Tran, um, having transparency meant having a good website that they could actually find the data and could interact with it. And for some users, it meant knowing everything about how many times the Census Bureau knocked on somebody's door. And if they, if nobody ever answered, did they go to a neighbor or did they use administrative data? And what, you know, and they wanted the details about how data was produced. Um, different users 
have different requirements and the, and the statistical agencies need to be able to be responsive to both types. If you combine it all together, you actually lose the user who does not care about how many times you knocked on somebody's door. You just clutter up their page. Um, but, if, but if you don't have that information, then you get into real challenges and concerns about the quality of some of the most important data resources that the federal statistical system um, produces, including the kinds of concerns that were um, that arose during the 2020 decennial census. Um, so we need to have transparency that speaks to different users. Um, and that is absolutely critical um, for the quality of the data and for the trust of the different users. Um, having transparency and reproducibility is critical. Um, I talked about this before in terms of scientific advance. We want scientific advance in the way that we produce our statistical um, data as well. And you can only do that if you can actually see what's been done before. That is again, true for both people inside the federal statistical system and people outside. Um, at the University of Michigan, we actually have a lot of people who work closely, whose research agenda is about improving how we do measurement. Um, and so the more that external researchers can understand and collaborate with statistical agencies, the more innovative um, they can be and the higher the quality of the uh, data that they produce and share with the rest of us um, is. It also having um, transparent and re reproducible um, data um, supports reuse and the potential integration of data for new applications. And just kind of like as an example, lots of businesses use federal statistical data. APIs need machine actionable metadata. They don't need PDFs of, you know, or a long, you know, impossible to read, you know, tiny, you know, uh, uh, print, you know, um, documentation. They need standardized um, machine actionable metadata that their machines can you can talk to, um, and that allows for the creation of everything from the you know the weather app that tells me that you know this the 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 snow in in Michigan and Ann Arbor is going to stop in 15 minutes um and um how many children I should be expecting to show up um in uh in the Ann Arbor um, public kindergartens next year so um standardized metadata um is is critical for transparency and reproducibility and it really allows us to use our data in more efficient ways Next slide. So there are some recommendations. Um, there are lots of recommendations in the report. I'm not gonna go through all of them, um, but I'm gonna summarize them. So the first is the, the probably the most kind of obvious, but it is, um, it is, it is still incredibly important to say is that federal statistical agencies should fully comply with federal record schedules. And one way to think about record schedules is they're like data management plans. They say what data they're going to collect, how they're going to collect it, why it needs to be collected, um, how it's going to be retained, when it's going to um, go to the National Archives. Um, and and I want to say so they should do this and they should have the and they should be provided with the resources to do it. It's always nice. Um, we don't the National Academies doesn't ever you know say you should give you know the, our statistics you should fund our statistical agencies at a level that um, makes it possible for them to do what we're asking them to do. Um, that's we don't say it that bluntly, but it is but. We all know that our statistical agencies and some of them in particular have been really underfunded for years um, and they can't do the things that we expect and need from them unless we fund them. So I don't write that down because that's Maggie speaking, not the National Academies, but um, but it but but we need to we need to combine the demands on them with the, the resources to do that. The metadata that accompanies such data should be preserved using broadly accepted metadata standards appropriate to the data at hand. I think Dan's going to talk more about um, those metadata standards um, in a minute. Um, we did not say you should use this standard or that standard. We said, you know, it depends on what makes sense if you're doing um, cross-sectional data is very different than if, than if you're the Bureau of Economic Analysis and you want time series data that's consistent with what's produced by um, other um, uh, national statistical agencies around the world, um, but we, but it is very important to use broadly accepted metadata standards. And as I say to people, if you invented it yourself, it's not a standard, right? You have to, you have to, 
it has to be done in collaboration with others. That means we have a very decentralized statistical system. They have to collaborate across themselves and they have to collaborate internationally um, with other statistical agencies and other um, uh, important stakeholders who are um, developing and advocating for metadata standards. These record schedules should be easily, so those data management plans for federal federal statistical um, systems should be easily accessible on each statistical agency website. They themselves right, should have some metadata so users know when and where microdata and associated metadata will be made available and when they are scheduled to be destroyed if that's what will happen. Um, the, the report also age, um, uh, uh, urges um, the ICBSP, the Interagency Con Committee for Statistical Policy, which represents the, includes the, the heads of the leading statistical agencies in the U.S. and the chief statistician of the United States, um, who's at the Office of Management and Budget, and that's Karen Orvis now. Uh, she was not in this office when we wrote the report, but um, the office was uh, not occupied, but Karen Orvis is in there now and is doing a great job. Um, so they should prioritize and reinforce transparency practices and engage with emerging standards and tool development. I want to say a tool development is incredibly important. Um, it is very expensive to create um, high quality metadata without tools and tool development really lags behind the standards. Next slide. Agencies that rely on contractors to collect data should require the sharing of processes and codes so that both that there is that there's both tra there's transparency both for the statistical agencies themselves and their users. A lot of our smaller statistical agencies rely on third parties, um, either the Census Bureau or private companies to do their data collection, and the and the agencies often um, do not get all the information that they need about their own data collection. Um, uh, we urge them to use checklists and actually one of the really great resources in the report that I urge you to take a look at, I think it's chapter seven, has lots of checklists to support best practices in data collection. Those are useful both for statistical agencies and for the re and for many of them for the research community to think about what you should be doing um, um, as you're collecting data. And eight, finally, agencies should adopt a user focus. And this I talked about earlier, that again, for some users, you need well-designed web interfaces, a portal where I can query things and get an Excel file that has what I want or make a nice little graph that I can, you know, that I want to use. They should be searchable. Data should be discoverable with straightforward, accessible metadata. Other users need a lot more um, uh, I'm going to say technically more sophisticated in many different ways. Um, metadata, machine actionable metadata. They want the code that generated um, estimates. They want detailed paradata. Um, this is important both for industry usage, um, for third party usage, and for evaluation of the quality and improvements to the quality of um, the under of the, the the estimates that are being produced and shared about the United States. Next slide. Um, I want to just give a plug to something which was not mentioned to the report or mentioned very briefly, if at all, but um, one, one result of the Evidence um, uh, Act has been the creation of a single portal where um, all researchers can apply for access to um, restricted data from any one of our federal statistical agencies. One of the things that this meant is that all 16 federal principal statistical agencies had to agree on a common core, if you like, of metadata about their data resources um, and a, a common set of fields. And that is represented in this um, single portal where you can apply for data, whether it's from you know, the Census Bureau or the NCHS who make their data available primarily through the Federal Statistical Research Data Centers or other agencies like um, the, um, the National Center for Education Statistics or um, that make their data available um, directly through them. It, it, from now on, if you if people come and want restricted data, this is where they should start. And there is metadata about every single one of the data resources that they make available in a restricted way um, uh, here. So this is, uh, it was, it's actually, it, it improves the fairness of federal statistical um, data enormously, just having, them all listed in the same place. Next slide. 
just finally, these are in case, in case you don't know ICPSR, we are always here to answer your questions, to talk to you um, both about um, our data resources, about the single portal research data gov, um, which we built for the um, federal statistical community, um, and, and data resources, even those that we don't have because at ICPSR, we love data. This is Love Data Week, so we have to say that. Happy data. Thank you, Maggie. Um, next up is uh, Dan Gelman, and so I'm going to switch slides, and uh, Dan is going to talk more about metadata. Same thing is no, oh, Dan. If you want to just start talking, maybe running a little bit late. Let's see. Sorry, I should have. Uh, so well, thank so. First of all, Barbara, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. And um, thanks, Maggie, for uh, sort of setting setting the stage and especially the little plug plugs you made about metadata and standards because those feed right into what I'm going to be talking about. And um, so if you can go to the next slide, get it in the... So as Maggie indicated, the uh, uh, report was uh, uh, overseen by the uh, uh, Committee on National Statistics. Um, they formed the Panel on Transparency and Reproducibility in Federal Statistics that began in the spring of 2019. Um, the uh, issuance of the report was delayed a little bit by the pandemic, um, and we uh, published the report in November 2021. As Maggie indicated, there were 14 members of the uh, uh, on the panel that uh, produced the report. Next slide. So in the report, we define transparency as a the provision of uh, documentation that's uh, sufficiently detailed uh, to uh, describe what it is that we're uh, trying to uh, make uh, uh, make available. And the, so the, the, the goal is to enable consumers of uh, federal statistics or really any, any data to accurately understand and evaluate how estimates are, are generated. And so from this, we need documentation and of course, metadata and documentation are two sides of the same coin. Next slide. So I want to say a little bit about reproducibility, even though that wasn't specifically in the report. Um, but uh, essentially, it means that we obtain the same result using the same data and, and process that was used originally. And so um, from the perspective of transparency, we need to document the process. And so uh, source code is a, uh, is a very important part of that. And so in a sense, that becomes part of the metadata that you would need to um, make uh, uh, some data or, or uh, study um, uh, transparent. Ne next slide. So getting a little deeper, um, by metadata, we mean data that are used to describe something, some resources. So this is a role for data. It's not a, it's not a kind, but that, that doesn't matter. We, we say that some data are metadata, and so we look to them to describe uh, something that we're interested in. So it's the same as documentation, but just more uh, formalized. Um, when, when we think of um, documentation, we typically think of Word files or PDFs or HTML pages. And for metadata, we think more in terms of a database or repository, relational databases, XML or hierarchical databases, um, a resource description, description framework or graph. Um, uh, databases, there, there are lots of different ways of organizing information. Not all documentation can be formalized in, in this way. Um, rationales, which uh, explain the reasoning for uh, uh, 
something, so designs or results, why uh, two results might be different um, is, uh, is important and, and it's sort of difficult to, to formalize. But for what can be formalized, we have metadata schemas. And so this is a framework for structuring and organizing metadata. They contain bins or elements for uh, storing and, and, and organizing the metadata that we want. So the schema then is like a template and a filled in schema, we refer to that as an instance. Next slide. So when we have a schema, we can think of this a little bit more generally as something known as a technical specification. It's a, essentially a formalized set of requirements. And when we're presented a set of requirements, we want a system to satisfy those requirements. We, we want a system to say, we follow this, tech, this technical specification. And if it satisfies all the requirements in the system, we say that it conforms to that um, uh, specification. And standards or examples of uh, technical specifications that are uh, developed in uh, uh, a special kind of process that's open, meaning anybody who has an interest in the outcome of the standards process can be involved. It's fair, that means that everybody um, has the same restrictions and rules applied to them. There are no uh, 500 pound canaries in the, uh, in the group. The uh, membership is balanced. That means that the different stakeholder communities are all represented. Uh, transparent, which is uh, no pun, but um, the idea is that uh, the process is open for inspection and that the process is achieved through consensus. So a standard that is developed under um, uh, that kind of process has the most chance of um, being uh, adoptable by a, a, a wide uh, audience. So um, why metadata standards? So they define how metadata are organized, typically through a schema. Um, they're, they're widely known and can be widely adopted and therefore they support interoperability. Um, systems that are designed to um, uh, implement standards uh, that, as I said before, they achieve conformity to the standards by satisfying all the requirements. And through that conformance, um, this guarantees that enough metadata is available. In other words, the standard is being followed. And if the standard has enough metadata in particular circumstances to uh, give enough information, all the documentation necessary for transparency, then conformity to a standard is a necessary condition for, for transparency. So we can be sure that we are transparent in a number of different ways by uh, adopting and conforming to standards. And there are many standards in, um, uh, for metadata and statistics. I'll go over uh, some of the DDI standards in a minute, but there's some others that, are, that may be of interest, the statistical data and metadata exchange, the generic statistical information model from the UNECE, and the generic statistical business process model also from the UNECE. So these are standards within the statistical realm that are uh, important and um, uh, you should, should know about them. There are other standards as well. And uh, there are a number of generic standards, uh, some from the World Wide Web Consortium, others from ISO that are um, important to, to know about and can help uh, with the development of systems. So the value then is that the 
uh, process for producing standards um, produces something that's relevant, a relevant uh, specification. So they are consistent with the current state of doing business. Standards are effective when they're revised on a continual basis, and this keeps them relevant. They, through the development of an, of an open, balanced um, sys, uh, uh, process, they address the needs of a, of a variety of stakeholders, and therefore is um, uh, the, the standard is relevant to a, a wide uh, uh, audience. Standards need to uh, have a, uh, the capacity to accept changes if, if mistakes or, or um, uh, issues of, of incompleteness are, are, are found. And uh, these are, are often made uh, available through things called defect reports. And then these lead to new versions or additions of the standard. And they produce an interoperability framework because if a number of organizations are all conforming to the same standard, they have just about automatic uh, inter interoperability and systems can communicate with each other. Next slide. So I wanna talk about the data documentation initiative on the ISIS community is actually uh, part of the um, initial and continued development of the uh, DDI. The DDI is not a single standard. It is a suite of standards and um, uh, other products that could be called standards, I guess, but aren't for uh, uh, particular reasons. Uh, the work is uh, organized under the DDI Alliance, which is a consortium of member organizations. There are close to 50 uh, current members. And um, as Maggie knows, it's managed at uh, ICPSR at the University of Michigan. Next, next slide. So I want to go through uh, some of the main standards and products just to give you a uh, an idea of uh, what uh, these are all about. So the oldest is called Codebook. I believe the current version is 2.5. Um, Codebook is in broad use, ICPSR uses it. Um, there is an interesting uh, uh, project managed by the World Bank called the International Household Survey Network. Um, it supports uh, mainly developing countries to help them produce and document data, especially around censuses and um, other uh, household surveys. But I haven't mentioned it in the slide, but uh, the World Bank has produced a number of uh, freely available tools that can help you um, use uh, the Codebook standard um, and um, uh, so it's it's uh, uh, wide uh, in wide use, um, and I believe it's part of the standard application process, which uh, Maggie um, uh, alluded to uh, with the research data uh, uh, gov um, uh, website in the National Secure Data Service. The um, uh, so it, it's part of the uh, process of uh, describing and uh, looking for uh, data to do uh, research in, in these uh, uh, data, data centers. The, the next standard is called Lifecycle, which is uh, up to current version 3.3. 3. The, the three refers to Lifecycle and the two refers to Codebook. Um, but the difference between the life cycle and the code book is that the life cycle supports the full statistical data life cycle. So from uh, planning through dissemination and archive, archiving, life cycle uh, addresses um, the, the main uh, points in that, um, uh, in, 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 in that life cycle. And it's consistent with the GSBPM standard that I 
uh, mentioned before the generic statistical business process model, which was developed and managed under the UNACE. If you're not familiar with that, that's the UN office in um, Geneva. Um, and life cycle is in use in many national statistical offices, including BLS. Um, in fact, uh, some offices have used it to a uh, um, large extent, I believe, Statistics New Zealand um, and uh, Statistics Canada uh, are both uh, using it um, uh, deeply. Um, one of the big differences between Lifecycle and Cobook is the fact that metadata can be reused in Lifecycle and shared. So it supports reusing, reuse and sharing of metadata across surveys, across time, and across revisions of the, of the survey. So when um, designs are reused, the idea is, well, I've written the metadata already to describe one survey or one iteration of a survey, then I need the same metadata to be able to, to describe a new survey or a new iteration of an existing survey. Why do I want to write this metadata down twice or multiple times? And the, the, the philosophy is, well, we want to, we want to reuse it. We want to link to something that's already been written. What this does is two things. It, it saves time because you don't need to uh, rewrite it. You don't need to dig up the old uh, description and, and recreate it. But it also eliminates what I call gratuitous differences. Because if you, if you have to reproduce something that's been written before, um, very often you find that little differences crop, in, crop up. And the question to a user who is not privy to the uh, decision that the same description is being used, it's just being rewritten. How do you know those differences aren't, aren't meaningful? Sometimes things can be said in a different way, yet the the producer of the metadata meant the same thing, but the reader of the metadata might think, well, gee, this is different. Is this really the same thing? It, I can see slight differences here. And why introduce that kind of confusion? So Lifecycle supports this idea that we want to share everything possible to reduce um, uh, and ambiguity and increase the um, uh, the uh, sharing of of descriptions. Next slide, um, Dan. I'm sorry, we're pretty much at time, so maybe just kind of very oh. quickly. Um, well, let let me go. Let let me just say that there's another standard in development. It's very close to um, it uh, a release point called cross domain integration. Next slide. Um, there are two uh, products, one called XCOS, which is an RDF vocabulary for describing classifications. SDTL is the st statistical data transformation language for documenting the process a, um, uh, for uh, producing read-only uh, metadata. And the next slide, the last one is that there are are many controlled vocabularies that are used within the standards to increase semantic uh, in, interoperability. Um, I, I, I'm losing the opportunity to talk about the development of systems, but okay, um, time's up. Uh, we will share the slides. Uh, my apologies for not having enough time. Um, <clears throat> And if you have questions, um, as I said, please put them in the chat and I will make sure that Maggie and Dan get them. I'm not sure, Sarah, were there any questions in the thing? I haven't been able to see. Yeah, I didn't see any come in, Barbara. 
Okay. Yeah, I don't see anything. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to just email myself. I'll put, um, I think everybody alive knows me anyway, but just in case three people that don't, so it's borderline at princeton.edu, and I will send to Maggie uh, and Dan. Uh, the slides will be made available. Um, I can't tell you exactly when, but as soon as um, we can fit them in, the recording will also show up. And um, thank you so much to Dan and Maggie for going through an incredibly complex area, not just the report, but um, you know, trying to um, illuminate us better on you know, why these things are important and uh, what um, your group is doing to try to improve things.